one, your friendly neighborhood atheist here. The music you just heard was by a progressive instrumental math rock band simply called Lord. That track was from their second album, Two, and will be playing music from their first album, One, as background music later in this video. If you like what you hear, check them out. Their Bandcamp page is linked below where you can download all three of their releases for free. Today, instead of doing a response to a specific video, I'm going to be taking a look at Saiten Brickenkate's website, proofthatgodexists.org. Now, for much of my atheist audience, the man and the site probably need no introduction, but here's a brief overview anyway. Sai is a presuppositional Christian apologist who has gained notoriety over the past years for his particular brand of argumentation. I'll be presenting the gist of his argument for God in a moment, but I will say right off the bat that he is opposed to evidentialist apologetics. That is, he feels it goes against Christian doctrine to present evidence of God to a non-believer. So going into this, I know ahead of time that I am not going to encounter any evidential support of God's existence. Instead, Sai's argument will revolve around trying to argue that God must exist and that atheistic positions are illogical. Well, fair enough, so let's see what his site has to say. Now the format of his site is it presents you with a series of questions, and with each question there are a couple of answers you can choose from. Now, Sai being an apologist, there is only one series of right answers as far as his website is concerned. There are lots of atheist YouTubers who have presented objections to various questions and answers in this website, so I thought I'd take a different tack. Instead of going through this and defending only the particular philosophy on these subjects that I believe in, I thought I'd quickly look at each possible answer and see if there isn't a way it could be justified. As such, I'm going to be moving quickly and covering a lot of ground, so if I miss something or mess something up, my bad, please let me know. Anyhow, time's a-wastin', so let's get started. So the first question is, does absolute truth exist? And the possible answers are, absolute truth exists, absolute truth does not exist, I don't know whether absolute truth exists, and I don't care whether absolute truth exists. The correct answer is, absolute truth exists, and we'll get to that in a moment. So what about absolute truth does not exist? That takes you to a question that asks absolute truth does not exist, absolutely true or false? And either choice takes you back to the first question. So how might you justify the answer absolute truth does not exist? Well, what does it mean for something to be true? And what does it mean for something to be absolute? These are both deep questions in the field of epistemology, not at all easy to answer, but let's take a definition that suits our ends here. So, we'll define truth as the set of propositions that most accurately reflects reality. Now, absolute means not contingent upon anything else. In other words, there are no prerequisites for its nature. So, an absolute truth must have no prerequisites. But this is a problem, for in order to be a truth, it must be a proposition, and propositions are mind-dependent. This means that absolute truth does not exist because truth is contingent, and an absolute contingent thing is impossible by definition. So what about the question, is it absolutely true that absolute truth does not exist? Well, clearly the answer is no, because such a question makes no sense. It is true that absolute truth does not exist, but it makes no sense to call it absolutely true any more than it would make sense to say it was greenly true. Now the next wrong answer is, I don't know whether absolute truth exists. So we'll obviously need a different interpretation of truth to click this answer. Let's say, truth is that which reflects reality. Now. Is it possible to say that you do not know that absolute truth exists under this definition? Yes, if you equate knowledge with certainty. If knowledge requires certainty, and you can't be certain about any of your sense experience, then it is possible to say that you don't know whether that absolute truth exists. Here the next question is, I don't know if absolute truth exists, absolutely true or false. Now in this case, the answer you give depends on the word absolute. Again, absolute means not contingent. Now, to know that you do not know something makes I don't know something a truth, but not an absolute one, because it is dependent on your mind to be true. This means, again, that the answer is true, but not absolutely true. The final wrong answer here is, I don't care if absolute truth exists. This one simply lets you exit the site, so I have nothing more to add. I mean, if you're here, you probably do care a little bit about whether absolute truth exists. So now let's choose the correct answer, which is absolute truth exists. This takes you to the next page, knowledge, where you can either say, I know something to be true, or I don't know anything to be true. Once again, this is a difficult question at the very foundation of epistemology, but here the correct answer is simply, I know something to be true. 
So, is it possible to justify the position, I don't know anything to be true? I would say it is. If we say that knowledge requires certainty, and we restrict knowledge claims to objective, mind-independent reality, it would follow that you cannot know with 100% certainty that anything is true, because your sense experiences are never 100% trustworthy. Now answering, I don't know anything to be true, takes you to the question, I don't know anything to be true, true or false, both of which take you back to the previous question. In this case, I would say the answer is true, and this would not contradict our previous answer, because it is true in a different way. Once again, this statement here, I don't know anything to be true, is true only with respect to the subjective, mind-dependent state of your awareness, and not necessarily or with certainty true with respect to absolute, mind-independent reality. But let's move on, answering correctly that I know something to be true. The next question is entitled Logic, and the answers are either Logic exists or Logic does not exist, and the correct answer being that Logic exists. So, how would we defend the idea that Logic does not exist? Again, this is a tricky question, and there are many different schools of thought. But let's define exists to mean has a real, demonstrable counterpart in objective reality. In this case, it's easy to see how we might say that logic does not exist, since logic is a process we use, a conceptual framework that describes reality but has no actual counterpart in objective reality. Choosing the option logic does not exist takes you to a question logic does not exist, where the answers are I use logic to conclude that logic does not exist, and I came to the conclusion about logic arbitrarily. Now obviously we just use logic to conclude that logic does not exist, but this does not pose a problem for our reasoning, because we used logic as a mental construct, in the same way that saying I used my imagination to think of X does not mean that things in our imagination have real counterparts in demonstrable reality. They're both just conceptual frameworks. But choosing either answer takes us back to the question of whether logic exists, so let's choose the correct answer, logic exists. This takes us to nature of logic A, either logic changes or logic does not change, the correct answer being logic does not change. So how might we justify choosing logic changes? Well, as it turns out, there are several different types of logic. So, for example, it is possible that Aristotelian logic applies to certain sets of propositions, while different forms of logic, such as three-valued logic or fuzzy logic, might apply to others, thus implying that, at least to a certain extent, logic does change based on what sort of set of propositions you are evaluating. But if you choose the option logic changes, the next question, logic can change, weirdly only has two iterations of the same answer, logic does not change, thus literally forcing you to choose that option. So we move on to the next question, nature of logic B. The answers are logic is made of matter and logic is not made of matter, the correct answer being logic is not made of matter. So how might we defend choosing the other option? Well, again, Let's look at how logic is a conceptual framework. Saying this, it means that I have in my thoughts a conceptual framework that I call logic. Since thoughts are patterns of neurons, this would mean that in the matter of my brain there exists a pattern of matter that represents logic. So at least in some sense, it could be said that logic is made of matter. Choosing this option takes you to a question, nature of matter, with the options matter changes or matter does not change. Choosing matter changes takes you back to the previous question, while choosing matter does not change prompts you to exit the site. So let's explore both possibilities. Now obviously we see things made of matter change, but in a sense matter itself does not change because it cannot be created or destroyed, it can only change forms. Of course the full picture is much more complicated, but it is possible to justify saying that matter does not change. On the other hand, saying that logic does not change, matter changes, and logic is made of matter does not constitute a contradiction. Why? Because the form of a thing might be universally the same while various forms of it change. For example, there is a certain form of matter that we would label a chair. Now, each and every chair slowly changes over time, eventually becoming not a chair, but that does not mean that the form of matter that we call a chair has changed, and at any time we can find or create another form of matter such that it has all the properties of a chair. So just because the matter in everyone's head changes over time, that does not imply that the form of matter that we call logic in their head ceases to be logic. And now let's take the correct choice. Logic is not made of matter. This takes us to the next question, nature of logic C, which gives us the options logic is universal and logic is person relative. The correct choice here is logic is universal. 
Choosing logic this person relative takes you to the same question, but changes the options to be both logic is universal. So how might we defend the statement that logic is person relative? Well, recall again how I've said a number of times that we can consider logic to be a conceptual framework. That being the case, that means that it's contingent upon the mind doing the conceiving. It is certainly the case that logic is universal to all minds which conceive of it, but since it is a framework which will apply to propositions, it cannot apply directly to any inanimate thing in reality without contingently applying through a mind. Thus it is not literally universal in that it cannot apply to everything without a mind first conceiving of it. So now we move on finally to the proof, after choosing the correct answer that logic is universal. The proof first asserts that truth, knowledge, and logic cannot be made sense of apart from God, and that therefore the proof that God exists is that without him you couldn't prove anything. It then asks you what you believe, whether you believe that God exists or not. The question is prefaced by this assertion. Any contrary view to the God of Christianity being the necessary starting point for rationality is reduced to absurdity. You have to assume God in order to argue against him. Choosing, I don't believe that God exists, takes you to a page of preaching that contains even more problems, but I'm not going to debunk them. Instead, I think I'll sum up. So I've just gone through every question and answer combination possible on this site. Now obviously Sai, as an apologist, is presenting the series of questions and answers he feels is most reasonable, and through it is hoping to convince others that what he believes is true. But as I've just shown, for each of these questions, it is possible to justify accepting any of the answers. That's not to say that I don't think that there are certain answers that are more justified than others, but that's not the point. The point is that these are very difficult questions to answer at the foundation of philosophy, and there are many different, internally consistent worldviews that can be built from different answers to these questions, some atheistic, some theistic. Sai would deny this and claimed that only his worldview is logical, rational, and internally consistent. And fundamentally, that's why I think this site is as bad as it is. It's just one man egotistically trying to pretend like his worldview is the only possible one, when well, that is clearly not the case. While I'm perfectly willing to discuss the intricacies of basically any worldview, I'm very much disinclined to have such a discussion with someone who thinks that they have the only possible consistent worldview when that is clearly not the case. Thank you everyone for watching. This has been your friendly neighborhood atheist, and until next time, best wishes!